All right, Sledge. Let's dig back. Oh, no, no, no. My bad. That's that's terrible. God, that see, this is the first time you got the cut, dude. Welcome hey. to ending. <laughs> yeah, finally. It's your purple shirt, dude. You're, you're gorgeous. You look gorgeous right now. I can't get over the fact how good you look. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's just, uh, you know, some people can wear pink and purple. Others can't. I feel like I can. You pull it off. As as people know, we're digging weekly here. The sleeves are always an option. The purple V-neck is something new, and I absolutely love everything you got going on. Appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. You are more than just a purple shirt, a good-looking, beautiful human being. You were a stud of a pitcher. The pitching conversation is still the conversation heard around the baseball world. The baseball, the injuries, the contracts. Where do we begin? Where do we begin, Sledge? I'll let you call it. Where do we begin with everything going on in the pitching world? You want to start with the contract situation? I want to start with Paul Skeens. We have a guy right now who is dominating the world. If the, if the, I'm just, the numbers are unheard of. We've had a, a couple of examples where we've been a little bit preemptive with calling someone up, but we have a guy who honestly could not do anything more to deserve a call up and he's still sitting down in AAA. It's part of the game that I don't understand. It's part of the game that I think we should change. What do you think's the answer? When you get to a certain level of domination, the domination that Paul Skeens is having right now in AAA, there's nothing on a developmental side, there is nothing more he can get better at until he gets to the big league level. You hear people all the time, ah, well, you know, the fastball, he's, it's 101, 102, but just a fastball can't get big league hitters out. It's getting AAA hitters out. The off-speed stuff is clearly getting them out because his ERA is, I mean, he's virtually unhittable. At this point in time, like we had a conversation with Wayno, he needs to get to the big leagues and understand, all right, this is the report. This is the execution I have to do throughout this lineup. And to me, that's the next step in his development. There is nothing left for him to prove at that level. He needs to start doing it at the big league level. And it's all serious. It must all be about contract manipulation at this point, because I see no other reason why he's still toiling away in AAA. Yeah, and, and Pittsburgh, this is the first time where I've kind of looked at Pittsburgh and I'm like, okay, there is a there's a real chance here that these guys can be good because you look at the young pitcher they have now in the big leagues, Jones. I know they're real high on Mitch Keller. You add Paul Skeens into this mix with the bullpen they have, with the bust and Chapman on the back end, like this can be a pretty good team. And why would you take that excitement away from them too? You're talking about a young squad. How much would that impact a young squad to have someone that's – Paul, I mean, he's done nothing at the big league level, I understand, but it's almost like a Strasbourg when you think about the excitement level of this kid coming up and potentially dominating big league hitters. It is. It is Strasbourg S. You're right. And I, I mean, at this point, Paul Skeens is, he's famous, dude. People know him from the College World Series. People know him from LSU. They have a, a sneaky big market out there. And the dude just looks, ultimately looks like a badass with the mustache there. He went to Air Force. Like, you can't tell me the mentality isn't lacking. Like, this dude's an absolute badass. He'll kill you with his eyes. It feels like one of those situations where he grew that out and had a good outing and then just decided to keep it for four years. <laughs> hey, buddy, keep it going because it is working right now. So uh, on that same level, that pitching, the manipulation contract, all that type of thing. There's been a lot of fun interactions on Instagram in our comment section on X talking about the contracts, the pitching situation, more specifically, Blake Snell. Mm. So for me, the Blake Snell versus the Yamamoto situation, because I know boy. I botched that name, Yamamoto. You see, make, I'm making the adjustments. We're coachable Again. over here. Well done. So to me, it's not even comparing the two. Who would you rather have? That's not the point. The point here is the system, the free agent system. For Blake Snell to be pitching seven years in the big leagues, two of them at a Cy Young level, and then get to a point in time where he's at contract time, why does our game, why are the top teams not seeking a Cy Young level candidate to come and add to their team to put them over the top because we are paying guys not based off of production, we're paying guys based off the metrics. Metrically mm. speaking, there's something there that says, this is not sustainable. I feel like the same thing has been said the last seven years about Snell's contract. This isn't sustainable. He goes out and wins another Cy Young last year. So to me, the point was the system 
of Yamamoto being able to be a free agent at 25 years old, sign, break the bank, versus a guy like Snell that's done it over here for seven years. But yep. it seems like his production is hurting him at the end of the day. That makes perfect sense. And the way you've explained it, obviously, that is exactly what we're witnessing right now. It feels like teams are getting away, and it, rightly so. Nobody wants to see their team. And we talk about, we don't, we don't care where our teams spend their money. Well, at some point, you don't want to see a 42-year-old veteran or a 38- to 40-year-old veteran sitting on the back of the roster making $25 million contributing zero. So I understand right. that they're trying to put more of an emphasis on value. But where can you show a guy that has never pitched at this level his value versus a guy, like you said, who has basically dominated two out of the seven years he's been there? Maybe it's the inconsistency. Maybe it's the fact that Yamamoto is brand new and they want to try him out. They want to have the, they want to have the sexy sign, so, so to speak, as opposed to Blake Snell, who's going to go out there and give you 180 innings and walk a few guys. Yeah, it's a huge risk for players now in free agency at that age. And I think some of the conversations we're going to have on here, we're going to bring Scott Boris on here to talk about this as well. We can really dive into this because if you are a player and you go sign in the Japan League and after the four or five years you have to play there, you then post to become a free agent in the big leagues. It's almost like that is the route MLB is pushing us, American-born players, the Latin-born players. They're pushing us that way because that's how you make your money. If the Snell situation is an example of that, then I don't know what is an example of that. And when you go back a little further, when the, when you sign your first original big league contract, they control you for six years, obviously. So they are controlling every single bit of cash that you earn for the first six years of your career. And when it's finally time that you get paid, you're still not getting paid. It's just a system that is broken at the moment and there needs to be a fix and it needs to happen quick. Otherwise, we're going to see some pissed off American players for, for a while. Agree. And, and to me, like we keep saying, it's a system. If the non-salary cap guaranteed money is the issue here with the negotiations, owner versus players, then it's like, all right, we need to change the system overall as a for a game. So let's make these top guys free agents after four years. If these teams are going to be incentivized to go out, pay these guys the money, you continue to see the market grow. You continue to see the games being much more quality, big league games competitive. And it's not happening with just the big superstar type guys like Snell, happening with guys like Tommy Pham, all type of free agents that it's like, how was this guy not have a job at this point in time? And Tommy Pham, look what he's done now with the White Sox. He's contributing instantly. He's a veteran guy who's coming to that at clubhouse. We can speak to that for forever. The frustrating part is that the amount of guys that have to now sign minor league, non-guaranteed deals with an invite to big league spring training, that would have been a guaranteed contract because of what they've done in the past that's a frustrating part for another level of players. Yeah, there's the superstars. They're always going to get paid. Then there's the next level. There's the fans. There's the guys that have contributed. They're not getting paid now. You go even further down, and there's the guys like me that spent their whole life just trying to trying to hang on. It's, I mean, Sweeney said it best in our last episode with him on Digging Deep. You have your clubhouse leaders. You have your spark plugs. You have your guys that hold people accountable in the clubhouse. And to me, a guy like Tommy Pham is one of those guys. So metrically, that doesn't grade out for his case to make money to sign yeah. a contract. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the game is trying to push away a guy like Tommy Pham when he consistently produces. Last year, he produced on a World Series on a World Series team. But why is the game trying to push him out? Because it's 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 not measurable. They want to value is put towards a number. And that is something that you can't measure. And it is something that's missing and it's going to be missing in our game. And they've tried to make it like fantasy baseball in the, in the sense that it's just about moving numbers and pieces around to try and make the best fit. Yes, yes. It's because there are certain people in my hometown of Miami that are giving interviews about our game, running a team that is just, <laughs> is where our game is at. Too early to evaluate that interview, right Eric. Now. It's too early to evaluate that interview, okay? I'm, I'm evaluating <laughs> it from the first word. I, I maybe even before the first word I'm evaluating. My it. goodness. So this is going to be an unpopular take here, but I here just go. don't give up. This is my, this is our <laughs> show. We're going to go on. Let's go right now. So the Chicago White Sox, okay, 
everybody wants to jump on board and crush Chris Getz and crush Pedro Grafal, crush everything that's going on about the team in Chicago that obviously got out to a bad start, all that type of thing. They had some injuries, whatever. What people need to realize is the owners of Major League Baseball, and this is probably going to get our show axed out of everything in MLB. That's fine. We're sticking up for the boys. We, it's fine. we don't need money. It's all good. We're sticking up for the boys. This is you may doing. not be. I do. <laughs> so I might get axed out of here, but Pete, make sure we look out for Pedro. Chicago, okay. As a GM, as a manager, you want to be able to do your job the way that you believe in doing your job. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that every single situation in the big leagues is a situation like San Diego, where you have free money, you go out there, unlimited, sign whoever you need to sign, get the best players you can get. That's what we're going to do here. There's a lot of GMs. There's a lot of managers that are under strict guidelines. And to me, you are never going to succeed in this game if you are not only trying to battle these guidelines, if you're not putting everything out into winning a big league baseball game from the top down in an organization, how do you expect to compete? How do you expect these guys in these positions to have success when you can't do the job the way you want to do it? It just feels like there's so much more coaching going on at the big league level. There's so much more guys. There's guys that are there that aren't prepared to be there right now. It's a frustrating time to be a fan of Major League Baseball because there's so much talent around. But when you look at the quality of the game, we're not getting the quality of games that we should be getting right now. And the White Sox are just a prime example. Is it the control of the front office? Is it the control of the analytics? You know that young managers don't have the freedom that they ever had back in the day. And you know that someone like a Bruce Bochy is going to come in and run things his own way. So mm -hmm. where's that balance? When are teams going to learn that there is a balance between old and new? Wainwright said that as well. There's got to be that perfect harmony between the information that we're getting on a nightly basis and the ability to spit it to the players and the ability to have not that just run our f***ing game into the ground. Yes, and that's where it takes everybody in an organization, from scouts to development to coaches, to everything, because like you said, there is a lot more teaching that's going on at the big league level now. And why is that? Because at the minor league level, this stuff isn't being taught. So as a scout, you need to go identify the best player. You bring him into your system. As a minor league coach, farm director, you then get the players, the scouts bring you, and your job is to teach them the game, develop them to be ready for a big league game. So when they get called up, they're in the right spot. They know where to be. You don't have to do that. That is the challenge when you are rebuilding an organization, when you are coming in and your job is to rebuild everything that's going on, that's how far down this goes. So that's why these rebuilds, some of these organizations, they take time yeah. because if you're not getting that proper treatment down there in the minor leagues, you're not getting coached a certain way, that's going to affect the big league team. And I think we see that a lot more in our game today. And if you miss on a couple of draft picks during the first couple of years of your rebuild, then you're going to be rebuilding for fucking ever. Yes. yes. There needs to be you some value to put back on winning now and trying to get players to help And in, at the very moment that you need that help. It's one thing to be planning three years, four years down the track, but that may not work either. So maybe put some value on winning again. I mean, bingo. There you go. When I was in the minor leagues with the Royals, Doug Sisson was our farm director. He was essentially the manager of every minor league team so being a farm director you rove around so you're going to go to double a for a week you then go see the low a team for a week and then you go to triple a for a week when sis was in town you knew damn well if you didn't play the game a certain way there was going to be stuff that happened on the back end you're not going to play you're going to get taken out of that game you were going to learn what you did wrong and you were going to play the game the right way a lot of these organizations now don't even have that position. They don't even have scouts. A lot of these organizations are just solely depending on the metrics and on the numbers. They feel like they don't even need scouts. And yeah. I think that's where we're taking a nosedive. And I think it all kind of comes around full circle. And that's something that needs to come around fast. For sure. All right, Sledge, Pedro, whatever kind of name we're using this week. We got the first time that we're going to bring a guest on Digging Weekly. And no other guy, no better guy to give the ball to day one than Mr. Adam Wainwright himself. So, Wayno, we appreciate you coming on, joining us, talk some pitching, talk about what we got going on right now. Man, thanks for having me on, Haas. It's always good to see you, unless you're batting against me. And then uh, I never have I never have got a whole lot of hang time with you, so I'm feeling this is a special time for me. 
Yeah, like Pedro was saying before, Wayno's just the ultimate dude. Not only the success on the field, but the teammates. I mean, from from Tommy Pham, Michael Walker, Skip Schumacher, anybody you name, everyone talks about how good of a dude Wayno is outside of what you've done at the field, what you've done on the field, all that type of thing. Wayno, we want to dive into some of this pitching stuff a little bit with you, man, because I think that's been a hot topic for us. That's been a hot topic for a lot of the people that listen in here. So when James Shields got traded over to the Royals, he completely opened my eyes, opened the whole team's eyes on starting pitching. He wanted his guys to get 200 innings a year. That should be the goal for the starting pitchers. I know now analytically the third time through the lineup is what a starting pitcher's nightmare is. A lot of these managers want to take them out before that. But in your mind, do you think because of the ball situation and the pitchers not trying to go deep into games, has that taken away that finesse that a starting pitcher needs to be able to go deep into games and get that 200 innings? Well, I don't think the ball is the reason um, for going less. I think the mindset, the approach, the the expectations have changed dramatically. Uh, and, and it's not just from a player's perspective. I do believe that organizationally, many organizations are telling these guys when they're in the minor leagues, and they train them this way too, you know, they don't mm-hmm. let them go more than four or five innings. They piggyback them with another starter and they split a game instead of letting the guy go seven innings. I think the mindset now is completely different. If a guy goes five and, you know, comes out with zero or one run or two runs, then he's done his job. You know, if a guy went mm-hmm. four and it was the best he had that day, then, you know, he did his job. And and that just was never the case when, when you were coming up. You know, there was days where, you know what, I didn't have anything today. I threw, And I threw 100 pitches in five innings. And that's what I had, but mm-hmm. I kept us in the game. Whatever you have a couple of those, you're like, I don't love it, but it happened. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I found a way. I did the best I could. Right yeah. now, I, now I think expectationally, guys are thinking, you know, all right, if I get five, six, there's no talk about nine. Mm-hmm. No one's starting off at nine. And 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 the, the here's the thing for starting pitchers, you should try to be your best closer. Starting pitchers should go into the game expecting to throw the first and the last pitch of the game, one pitch at a time. And I don't think there's many guys doing that. Now, I think if they go seven or eight or nine, it's a complete surprise. And they're you know, like, what? That was unbelievable. you know. But I, here's the thing. They're going to come back around because money. The guys who are going to get paid are the guys who are going to go deeper in the games. The guys mm-hmm. who are going to get paid are the guys who are who are not striking out eight guys in four innings, they're the guys who are striking out eight guys in six and seven innings and eight innings. You know, the guys that are the number one pitchers, the ace pitchers in the game, those are the ones that are pitching deeper into the games. Those are the ones that are getting paid and going to get long-term contracts. You're going to see a lot of short-term contracts with these guys who are going four or five innings. And that's that. that the only way that's going to change is if the mindset circles back around. But the good thing about baseball is it seems all cyclical. It seems like things come back. I mean, when I first came up, my first pitching coach told me I should never lift anything with my upper body heavier than five pounds. <laughs> he did. He was super old school, but he was like, listen, I pitched for a long time, never saw an injury. Everybody lifted no more than five pounds. Then it was like, get Jack, get as big as you could, lift as heavy as you could. And then it was like, you know, the heck with those job exercises and cuff weights and all those kinds of things. Now we're, now we're doing power lifting. And all of a sudden it was circling back around. It was like yoga and, Pilates and all these things were thrown in there. And then it was kind of like, well, there's more band exercise. It's like now it's coming back around where we know some of those old things, the shoulder care and stuff was really important. Cuff weights were good. And that was kind of like, you know, I think it's going to come back around anyways. Mm-hmm. I think it's been, I think the important thing is that I specifically am not blaming today's players on what's happening. This has been driven by the teams and it's been driven by the analytics departments and it's been driven by the labs. This is what teams wanted. So the players are giving them exactly what they've asked for. Now the problem Mm -hmm. is we've got to deal with the consequences. So from an offensive standpoint, if you take what Wayno just said right there. So as a young player, Let's say you have a pitching matchup. It's Wayno versus Kershaw. And likely in the postseason, that's what the matchups are going to be. So if you have a guy in the first or second inning on third base, less than two outs, if you as a young hitter were to go out of the zone and let's just say hit a ground ball, get that runner in because you need contact, it's likely going to be a low-scoring game with two aces on the mound. As a young hitter, you then chase, you hit the ball on the ground, RBI is a semi-lucky stat. So... You really, from an industry standpoint, are not driving up your value. 
So, Wayno, my question to you, in St. Louis for all those years, like we talked about before, when you look at St. Louis, that winning culture, that is Wayno, that is Yachty, that is Albert, that is all these guys. How on those later ends, how are you able to balance with the young guys being like, hey, we need you to do this to win when the industry is saying we need you to do this to get paid? Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough thing. It's a tough, you know, when a young guy thinks he's got to do something a certain way to get paid and take care of his life and his family or whatever, he's probably going to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's hard. And and it's so for a minute there, it was all about like let's take hitters for instance. It was all about launch angle and driving the ball, getting the ball up the air. And so the guy who was hitting 40, 45 home runs, thirty five to forty home runs striking out 200 times wasn't a big deal like yeah that's that's all right that's valuable teams started filling up their rosters with guys that could have 30 home run potential but we're going to strike out a lot and then you saw games get really long because there was a lot mm. of three two punch outs and two two punch outs and and then it was all about you know the pitchers reacting like all right we got to start pitching up in the zone and we got to get past this launch angle thing when in reality hitters aren't driving balls that are knee high across the bottom very often there's very few hitters that can go down there and drive a knee high ball in the air. They're hitting the thigh high ball. That's what they're launching. Like Josh mm -hmm. Donaldson, when he was talking all about all that, you still look at Josh's his approach and his his successes. It's all across the middle of the zone. It's all across yeah. thigh high across. And that's it's not just Josh. It's almost every I mean, pause as you too, buddy. Everybody like you like that ball up a little bit, which hurt me a couple of times. <laughs> but you know, you, you weren't hitting the ball painted down and away in the air. Very few guys do. And so I think we overreact a little bit. And, and so you saw some guys who all of a sudden their ERA started going up, walks started going up, games got even longer because everybody was chasing the strikeouts. And the fact of the matter is the best pitchers in the game, they don't get strikeouts very often on 2-2, two, 3-2 two, two pitches. The best pitchers in the game are 0-2, 1-2 all the time. The mm -hmm. guys in my era who were 0-2, 1-2 the, the most, Roy Halladay, Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Justin Berlander, you know, Felix Hernandez. These guys are 0-2, 1-2, every single at bat. The approach is, I'm coming right at you. I'm attacking you in the zone. With, I'm doing good stuff. I'm locating on thirds, baby. Maybe even halves of the first bit. You know who leads the league every year in middle-middle pitches? Max Scherzer. Every single year, he leads the league in middle-middle pitches, and it's always on o, -O counts. Mm -hmm. oh. Strike one. He's getting ahead, man. Strike one. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get 0-1 instead of 1-0, the, 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 the on-base... Plus, the the slug it goes drastically down. It's like in half if you get 0-1. Max always says it's a choice. 0-1 is a choice, and uh, he comes right at you. 0-1, 0-0. He's now he's 0-1. Scherzer comes right at you. Kershaw comes right at you. Verlander right at you. They're 0-1. That's when they get punch outs. 0-2, 1-2, and they got them on the defensive. And you do that. Oh wow! All of a sudden you're pitching six, seven, eight, nine innings. Instead of trying to get swing and miss on strike one, you throw a slider a foot off the plate. Mm -hmm. These guys aren't swinging at that. Now you're 0-1. Mm -hmm. Then you got to try to get a swing and miss on 1-0. Now you're 2-0. Then, oh, crap. Now i got to come to you. And then, bam, you got a gap. I mean, it's, these pitching philosophies are not brain science. Mm -hmm. You know, this is stuff that, that should be taught at every level, and I just don't know it is. That's one question for me, too. I think we're doing more coaching and teaching at the big league level than we've ever done before in the history of the game fact yeah a lot of guys come up and they have don't no idea how to play the game mm -hmm. uh, you see it on every team i ever played against these last five six years there's so many guys who are young that just don't know they do something and you're like dude what in the world were you right. thinking they're like i don't i mean no one ever told me that and you're like really how's that possible <laughs> you know and it's just uh the money of the game drove that too guys mm -hmm. coming up sooner they're cheaper they're they're a lot more cost effective they can run a couple of guys through the minor league train and and spend a, a fourth of the amount of money that they would on a veteran player that you know might know how to play the game proper but all these things will come back around and like you said that's all the way down to kids trying to get college scholarships you know that is what they are looking for and today in the big leagues it seems like guys when they hit for agency especially pitchers when it's time to get paid they look at metrics versus production. To me, that's kind of where, like you say, it always comes back around. Do you think that's ever going to come back around? Or do you think that has to be maybe a change in the system because they don't want to pay guys through a certain amount of years? But how do we get back to kind of, you know, when a top pitcher gets on the market, 
we need the top teams chasing that guy if that's what gets them over the hump. There's this really cool balance of old school and new school that needs to be more in place. I think a lot of organizations now have gone very, very new school, which I think every organization should have very, very new school thinkers a part of their process. Mm -hmm. But I also think that every organization should have old school thinkers a part of the process. And then they should kind of butt heads and that's good. And then you mm. should come up with decisions, you know, but, but here's the thing. I broke down a picture yesterday, uh, for TV and this guy's like metrically his fastball is below average spin and it's below average, uh, vertical rise. And it's, but he uses it up in the zone and the slug and, and the batting average against are like 100 and the slug is like, you know, 214. And there's just nothing happening on it. And it metrically mm. makes no sense it works yeah. <laughs> so it can't always be metrically driven always because there's some outliers it's like dude i don't know why this guy gets out but he does it's he freaking does. weird but it works <laughs> and 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 there's pitchers out there like kyle hendricks for instance he's not throwing 100 miles an hour the guy's not throwing 90 miles an hour but he pitched in the world series and was shutting you know the eventual almost champs down like it was nothing and pitched some of the biggest games in Chicago Cubs history. And and he was just spotting up 86, 87 with great movement to the corners. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me the other day, could Greg Maddox pitch in today's world? And I'm like, Greg Maddox won 355 mm -hmm. games. And they're like, yeah, but could he pitch in today's world? I'm like, okay, are you asking me if a guy who could throw four different pitches to any quadrant of the strike zone in any count – could get out in today's game with with massive <laughs> movement. Yeah. And guess what? He'd be the best pitcher in the game today. He would be. Yeah. What about Tom Glavin, though? Tom Glavin could dot a Nat's ass one inch off the plate, <laughs> and then if the umpire gave it to him, could take it two inches off the plate. And if the umpire gave it to him, could take it three inches off the plate. And then if the umpire didn't give it to him, he'd bring it back to two inches off the plate, and then he would throw his change up in the exact same spot and get you to swing and miss or roll over. Yes. There are pitchers, mm -hmm. great pitchers can pitch in any era. That's just the way it goes. And there's a difference in throwing and pitching. And this is my big soapbox that I always get on. Throwers are not going to make it in this game. Pitchers are the going to be the making. What? And it starts at catch. It starts at catch. Guys should be playing catch, not fetch. You know, you look around nowadays, guys playing, they're playing fetch, man. It's one throw after the other right over the head. You know, you can mm -hmm. still have a great quality throw and throw it to the letters of a guy and work on things while you're working on arm strength. You just can. It's a focus level and it's a choice. And and these guys, I just don't know. Sometimes we do that. Yeah, I, I feel like a big, a big thing about pitching in the big leagues, especially a starting pitching, I think a lot of people get confused. When you're younger, you want to be nasty. You want your stuff to just be disgusting. And you think that'll get hitters out. I don't believe at the big league level – that there's maybe a handful of relievers that have that stuff that can get you out and you face them a couple of times, you start to see it more. But as a starting pitcher, to me, it's like, okay, when you game plan for a team, Wayno's facing Haas, I need you to pound the cutter in on Haas. And then when you face Pete, I need you to go low and away and be able to execute that game plan. One thing that I always enjoyed as a veteran player was watching the pitcher have their meetings and I mean, you and Yachty, those are the, I mean, you guys are the Hardy bros of the MLB, basically the tag team that everybody loves. What were some of those meetings like? Was it, Yachty, I'm going to stick to my strengths, and then if you face a guy a handful of times, you don't have success, we'll change it up? Or how did that, how did that go between you and Yachty? Well, we, we each did our own individual film work, prep, preparation going into the game, and then we would meet with the pitching coach beforehand, we would go over each hitter, you know, and, and I think this should be pitcher led. Um, if a pitcher is really prepared, pitcher should go through his game plan of a hitter first, and then the catcher should then offer in like, I like it. Or, mm, you know, actually, I think when we get to two strikes or blah, 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 you know, then you have this great healthy conversation, but the pitcher should be leading that, I think, especially a young guy, because uh, he may not know yet, but this is how you talk him through learning. You know, if you just let the catcher lead it, then he's just going to go, okay, yeah. And especially with Yachty for so long. I mean, you know, they weren't going to shake Yachty. No, <laughs> they weren't going to shake him. 
But it, as a hitter, you know, when I saw a pitcher, a young pitcher do that, I knew Yachty was given the fake shake. I'm like, no chance. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> well, it happens so many times where a guy shook Yachty and they come in and be like, oh, shouldn't have shook him, man. It, was like, <laughs> it ended up being a double, you know. And, and Yachty was just, he was two pitches ahead of guys. I mean, it was just so yeah. fun to watch. Goldie used to say he was, he was facing, he was facing Yachty first and then the pitcher because he, he was trying to, you know, <laughs> out thinking. But here's the thing, though. Hitters have holes. Almost every hitter has a specific hole they don't want to hit. They just don't like it. Mm -hmm. I knew. How's you come back to play at all? I, you're going to pound the cutter up and in on me, Wayno. I know. I'm, I know what you're going to do. I'm pounding, <laughs> I'm pounding that cutter in. And, you know, I have to say this, too, middle conversation before I forget it. Oz gave me the ultimate comment, uh, compliment one time when you were still in Kansas City and I pitched against you the day before and I'm walking out to to shag the day the day after a play catch and you looked at me and you went, why are you, get out of my life. Get away from me. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, man. It, it, it's so, uh, it was because you knew a guy like Wayno. So we talked about this before. You're in the minor leagues. You go from series to series. That team has one report. This team doesn't know what you can't do. But Wayno, you just he, knew he knew what your weakness was every he, single time, and he was not going to not throw where your weak spot was. Well, the the fun thing here's the fun thing about facing you is that you throw that cutter in, and you're you know you might swing or jam or whatever, and then you throw it again. And then, and then I see this look in your face, and you go, "I ain't swinging at that again." And so you throw it in there again, <laughs> and then you take it, and you look out at me like, "All right, I ain't swinging at it." Now what are you gonna do? And then I throw the little front door hippie guy. I love that oh, sequence. Yeah. I love that sequence so much. But you Freeze know, if, as soon as he gets, because you're so good out over the plate, if you let a guy like you get extended out over the plate, you're gonna have a hard time. You gotta get <laughs> hitters like you. You gotta gotta get them off what they love. To be able to, then you can, yeah, then you can, then you can pitch to the to the whole plate and not just to one little area. But I love bringing that curveball down and in on you too, off that same <laughs> little look. But you know, Haas, he made the adjustment. I was facing him in in San Diego in twenty in the playoffs, and we were winning, we were winning like four nothing in the fourth inning, mm -hmm. and uh, and I had an O two count on him with a runner on second, and I buzzed this fastball, and it was like right here, and he went. <laughs> Their baseline, baby. Yep. <laughs> hit a little, hit a little liner down the left field line. I'm like, he has never done that <laughs> life. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, it was just uh, I love those matchups, man. I love thinking back mm -hmm. on those things, and and the the chess game was always my favorite thing about pitch. Yeah, and that's and that is half the battle is is identifying what those holes are and just trying to execute. You know, you get the game plan, you try and execute, and that's what it is. Wayno, man, we appreciate you, dude. Obviously, you know that the respect and the, the admiration, not only of us, but every guy in the league has from you. We appreciate you being the superstar of our league and being the way you are. And I'm fired up for the big league impact this year. I watched the draft the other night, so I'm ready to go, man. I can't wait for it. Uh, thanks, dude. I appreciate you, too. It's always been fun to, to play against you. Great to see you, Pedro. You, too, huh? So, all right, we got digging deep. We got Tyler Glass now coming. I mean, we're balls deep into this pitching discussion. What better guy to come on, talk about the grips, talk about the baseball. I said you look gorgeous in your purple shirt. Not this as good dude as him. is, this dude, my gosh. He the is, hair's slowing. He, he's big, he's tall, he's handsome. He walked in, took over that room, took over that house in Arizona, but his conversations are elite yes and then justin sua obviously people know sua was with tampa for a long time as the development skills coach glass now was with sua for a while so their relationship and getting to see them talk on camera is going to be something great too all right sledge this was fun can you run right, back right. the v-neck next week i don't know if, i don't know i might just have, have to go another purple one. Different colors. Just okay okay colors. I, as long as you got more colors good that one looks damn good buddy thank you Appreciate it. i've gone from a cutoff with the v-neck cut so you know it's lifting see ya